Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate everyone being here. Um, it's really kind of weird for me to be working in this kind of environment. Um, I'm used to standing in front of students or people and kind of doing my act, you know, swinging my arms and making noises. So I'm going to do my best to try to keep this as lively and as interesting as possible. Um, I know there are some people who are familiar with my work in Valley of Fire. I know that uh, for the last 20 years, I've been kind of known as Mr. Valley of Fire because that's where all my research was, uh, was concentrated. But once I retired, I had the, the inkling to try to do something else. I'm not done with Valley of Fire, but I wanted to move on with some other different material. And I became a, I became a research associate at the Las Vegas Museum of Natural History um, in 2017 and began doing some research on artifacts. And I figured what better way than to pick some sites and do a reanalysis and see what I get from them. Unfortunately for me, um, I managed to pick one of the biggest and most complex site complexes in Southern Nevada, the Red Springs site complex. Um, and so it's gonna take me a while to get through all of the material I wanna get through, but it keeps me busy. It uh, keeps me out of trouble for the most part and out of my wife's hair. So in talking about Red Springs, let me make sure I got the right slide. Okay, this first picture is a picture from Red Springs before the boardwalk was put up um, back when it was a, just a picnic area uh, managed by the BLM and before there was a lot of uh, management going on out there. And since then, as most of us probably know, there's a boardwalk, there's fencing, there's a lot more active and passive protections out there for Red Springs. And so today, Red Springs is a favorite spot for people to picnic, but also visit and find out, you know, something more about the natural and cultural environment of Southern Nevada. Red Springs is a significant site complex. As, as we all know, it's at the base of the Spring Mountains. It's on the eastern edge of the Red Rock Canyon area. And at the, at the present time, and I am sure that there's more that I've missed here, it consists of these following features. Um, there was a rock shelter overhang plus a cave based on notes from a researcher from, called Karma K. Miller. Plus there are five additional other rock shelters, um, four of which contain cupules, which are um, depressions that are used to grind food uh, located by the cultural resource team of Red Rock between 2017 and 2020. Again, big thanks goes to Chuck Williams for providing that information for him. Um, there are 45 petroglyph panels at least, two grinding slicks, six additional cupule locations. And again, as you can say, thanks Chuck, I do appreciate it. Um, and a surface scatter of artifacts. Now this is a map. On the left-hand side, you see where the project area is located in, um, in relationship to Las Vegas and the rest of Red Rock. On the right-hand side, I've got the major map um, where, 20, where Red Springs is, uh, 26K, 26CK224 slash 458. And then up on the upper right-hand side of that map are four sites that I had recorded back in the uh, 1990s when I was working by myself. I had my own company. Uh, but there'll be another map that'll show you much more of the extent of the Red Springs complex, um, which I had no idea because I wasn't all that familiar after, you know, after I left the BLM in the late 1980s or, or mid 1980s um, with the area. This is a, a sketch map of Red Springs. And this was a map that was provided by the Friends of Red Rock Cultural Resources um, team or committee. And as you can see, this is a map that lays out um, where the majority of the uh, petroglyphs are and where some of the grinding slicks or grinding rocks are and gives a really reasonable idea of how this particular site, just this one site, uh, Red Springs, is laid out. And here's an example of some of the things that were found. Uh, grinding slicks at Red Springs. And again, notice that uh, the photos are, have been provided by Friends of Red Rock Cultural Resources Committee, um, in which material was provided for me by the SHPO's office. And I am very appreciative of all this material. Now, Red Springs has kind of a love-hate relationship with the archeologists of the region. 
it's been recorded and mentioned in some form or another in several in several areas by several projects. Okay, the first mention I've seen of it in the um, literature was by Shuttler and Shuttler. They had a, a publication in the Nevada State Museum uh, um, Archaeological uh, Series, um, Volume Seven. It's the Archaeology of Red Rock and uh, Valley of Fire. They mentioned the site, which was then called 26CL224 on page 18 of their publication. And they noticed that the following information or artifacts were collected from the site by Shuttler and Shuttler. Two sandstone grinding stones, chopper, hammerstone, a little bit of pottery. And there was a table of pottery design elements um, in that uh, publication. Richard Brooks, who I'm sure that a number of people knew or knew of, um, also recorded the site in 1969 when he was doing uh, sample surveys for the Bureau of Land Management in the Red Rock area for preparation of opening the area up more for uh, recreation and for public education. He put 17 auger holes in the site to detect the, the expanse and the depth of the midden at the site. He also noted, and these are from his notes, several late projectile points and pottery on the site service. What he basically meant by this was um, projectile points that date from the Virgin Anasazi or the Patayan or the Paiute uh, period, which ranges for anywhere from about the time of Christ to modern times. Other researchers have also mentioned the site. Um, Moen, in a report that he put together that was uh, submitted to the BLM, uh, Brooks et al. also um, in part of, as part of this, um, this sample survey uh, mentioned it. Connie von Schlichter did some work there under the, uh, um, under the supervision of uh, Keith Myrer. Uh, Larray Bringhurst, who uh, a lot of people I know knew, a great avocationalist who did a lot of work with rock art. She talked about the site and Bill White. Bill White, a professional archeologist uh, wrote a fairly large document talking about uh, rock art sites of Clark County and putting together a preservation plan for the rock art. In 2004, the Friends of Red Rock Canyon, uh, along with Archeo Nevada Society, which an organization I had the pleasure of being the president of for 10 years before I retired, um, undertook a recording project at the site. They did photographs, they did drawings um, of the petrical panels, doing a really, really fine job. Um, and also recorded other features at the site. And without this kind of work, um, what I'm gonna be talking about tonight would absolutely not be possible. I am really appreciative of avocationalists. I've been working with them for years. Some of them are some of the best archeologists I know. And um, many of them become very good friends of mine. And so I'm very, very appreciative of the work that's been undertaken by advocationalists, not only here, but in places like Valley of Fire and elsewhere in, the, in Clark County. Recently, like I said, I became an associate at the Museum of Natural History here. And frankly, uh, I had retired earlier uh, in 2017 and I promptly managed to uh, get ill. And so I had to delay some of the work that uh, I was doing for the museum. But I then decided that I really wanted to um, do something productive and go through the uh, materials that are in storage at the Natural History Museum. They become the, the Southern Nevada repository for artifacts. And I had discovered that I had papers um, from Carmen K. Miller. Carmen K. Miller was an avocationalist. I've got to put here as an amateur archeologist, but really an avocationalist um, who under the direction and permission of the Nevada State Museum um, and Dick Shuttler did a lot of work in the Red Rock area and elsewhere. I discovered I had his, some of his papers, some of his notes, and the notes consisted of notes from Red Springs um, detailing what he did, um, detailing the kind of excavations that he undertook, uh, site uh, artifact collections that he undertook, um, and also took photographs. And so I've got these three by five black and white photographs that I'm working on getting 
digitized and expanded so I can use them. But he also did work in places like um, Sandstone Quarry and White Springs. And he also did general work around the, uh, the Red Rock area as well. So he did an awful lot of work and fortunately uh, saved all this material, sent it all to the State Museum. And so we have access to this um, really, really great repository of information um, that otherwise may have been lost. So Miller's notes and a letter that he directed to Dick Shuttler at the Nevada State Museum uh, were part of these notes. He also took, like I said, photographs at the site, um, excavated two one by one meter units into a rock shelter there. Um, it's more of an overhang, but uh, I can locate it uh, if I have the, have the photograph in front of me. Um, and also did some fairly extensive surface collections. According to his notes and his letter, he collected hundreds of ceramic shirts. And these were analyzed, not necessarily by him, but I believe by UNLV students later on in the 90s. Um, we covered almost 100 reject uploads, uh, significant amounts of lithic debris and tools, and a large number of grinding stones as well. Um, I've seen notations in his notes that he sent up at least a box of 25 grinding stones to the Nevada State Museum in 1965. And there are our, our other grinding stones found in the collections of Red Springs at uh, the Museum of Natural History, which I haven't been able to get to yet. I've still got quite a bit to do um, on the uh, artifact collections at Red Springs and at other sites in the Calico Basin. So this, what I'm gonna be talking to you about tonight is kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, so basically I am building on Karma K. Miller and I am building on the work that a lot of other people have done in the Red Springs area. Um, so I'm gonna do combine the, uh, that older data with my fresh analyses of the lithic material and I'm gonna talk about um, timing and length of occupation of the site and the uses to which the site was put. Now, please keep in mind, this is all preliminary. I gave a paper about this at the uh, last three corners conference in 2019. So this is kind of building on that. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get back into the museum uh, since you know the world shut down, <laughs> but uh, hopefully I'll get back to it soon. Okay, here's the complex. Preliminary examination of projectiles from the complex. You see the chart on the right-hand side, okay? Um, broken down by projectile point type, um, obsidian, um, and uh, material of manufacture. You can see there's chert, there's obsidian, there's chalcedony, and a couple of other things there. Um, the preliminary examination um, suggests a possible span of use from the late archaic uh, at least from 4000 BC through what we call the proto-historic Paiute or Pataian period. Now, for those of you not totally familiar with the cultural history of Southern Nevada, very, very quick 30 second or so uh, breakdown. Basically what we have, and I'm gonna start with the archaic period. There are a couple of periods before then, but the archaic period, um, which is uh, the earliest period of hunters and gatherers who were adapted to the desert, uh, dates from about 7,500 uh, BC to about AD BC, okay? It is followed up by, and is broken down to the gypsum and the uh, pinto periods. And that's broken down by um, not only date, but also by diagnostic artifacts. We also have followed up the Virgin Anasazi occupation of the region, which dates between um, AD one or so to about AD 1250 where the Virgin Anasazi who were agriculturalists, um, or at least part-time agriculturalists and pottery users expanded out of the Virgin River and the Muddy River areas into Southern Nevada, into the Las Vegas Valley. At the same time, later in that period, a group from the lower Colorado River called the Patayan, who are uh, pottery makers using red on buff pottery, um, also occupied the region coevally with the Virgin Anasazi from about AD 1000 on. 
The Virgin Anasazi withdraw from the region about 1250 AD, and they are superseded or supplanted by the Paiute peoples who were in here uh, in the region when European American settlers hit the place in the 1820s. And so what we're looking at here is a fairly significant time period of use and occupation of the Red Spring site, nearly uh, 6,000 years. And as you can see from the data, um, and I'll tell you about it, um, there is an, an ebb and flow of the material and occupation of the region. The largest number of the whole projectile points, um, these are Rose Springs and Eastgate points, um, which are usually associated with Virgin Anasazi occupation. This is the largest percentage of whole projectile points. Okay? The next largest comes from the late prehistoric or protohistoric occupation. Those are the desert side notch and the cottonwood triangular type sites, uh, points. So what we have here are a later heavier occupation. The previous occupation um, during the archaic, this is typified by the Humboldt, Gypsum, and Elko points you see on the screen, was relatively light, but constant throughout time. And the majority of the total were made of local chirps, while the rest were made out of obsidian. And this obsidian would have been imported from a number of different places. Um, there's an obsidian source south of Las Vegas near the California Nevada border. There's an obsidian source, a fairly big one on the Nevada test site called not surprisingly Obsidian Butte. There's some in the Cane Springs wash area in Lincoln County and several others. And so obsidian was not a well, um, a, a well available local stone. So it had to be brought in. So we know from this material that there was at least some outside contact um, in terms of trade with other groups in the area. Now, please don't try to break this, <laughs> this um, screen down. You'll notice that this is the ceramic breakdown. On the left-hand side, you will see just ceramics by type, okay? And, usually, and basically broken down more by, um, more by um, numbers than by um, time period. You can see that um, we have the number of ceramics um, for each type, the dates of each one of these types and the cultural affiliation. Now, this right now I'm sure kind of looks like just noise, okay? It's a lot of numbers, it's a lot of words, it's a lot of letters, okay? Don't worry about that one, worry about the one on the right-hand side. I put the one on the left-hand side up because frankly, I tend to be, you know, kind of a, a type A personality when it comes to doing my material. And I like to give everybody all the information I can. By time period, you can see on the right-hand side, certain ceramics used by the Virgin Anasazi are very long-lived, okay? Um, North Creek Gray, which was a, uh, a plainware used by the Virgin Anasazi populations, you notice there are a lot of them out of the total, 441 out of 1,248 total uh, ceramics that were um, collected. But then we have um, Boulder Gray, which is also long-lived. And then we have Prescott Gray and Deadman's Brown, which are ceramics from other uh, cultural traditions, suggesting that there is either trade or movement of peoples in the area um, from the South into the Las Vegas Valley. Now, what's more important here, I think, are the breakdowns by time period. There is a, a fairly significant occupation early in the Virgin Anasazi occupation of the region. Early Basque Maker III Pueblo I. These are time periods broken down um, just to help archeologists organize material. But you can see the dates on the right-hand side, uh, 8,400 to 1,000. This is when we get the heaviest occupation of um, the Red Springs uh, site uh, by the Virgin Anasazi. So 25% of all um, ceramics date to this early period. There's a middle period that's called Pueblo II, dates from 81,000 to 1150, relatively short. You can see much few, many fewer um, ceramics um, 
So for some reason, although we can't always be sure that uh, there seemed to be a drop off in Virgin Anasazi use of this particular site. And then there's an uptick just a little uh, during the late uh, Pueblo three, which dates from 1150 to 1225. And then a, a relatively minimal um, occupation during the late prehistoric or prehistoric period, historic period dating 8,900 uh, to historic. So ceramics from the Virgin Anasazi tradition dominate the collections. As you can see, it's 83% of them. And this is just kind of a repeat of what I just said. It's likely that a number of the long lived ceramic types, the North Creek, the Boulder Gray, et cetera, were used also during the early period as well as the middle and late periods for the Virgin Anasazi, which I think kind of skews the data a little bit. Uh, the minor uh, material from outside the Virgin Anasazi occupation suggests that Red Springs complex was mainly exploited by local Virgin Anasazi populations and that the quote unquote exotics, okay, um, were likely trade items from elsewhere. Now, one of the things that are very, that's very, very important to figuring out what goes on in an archeological site is the rock art, petroglyphs and pictographs. Petroglyphs as we know are those things that are carved into the rock, pictographs are painted on. The type of petroglyphs we find at Red Springs also may support the data that were based on both the ceramics and the projectile points. But frankly, um, I need to do a lot more work on the photographs and drawings before drawing any firm conclusions. Fortunately, uh, thanks again to the Friends of Red Rock Cultural Resource Committee and others, um, when you take a look at the motif tally sheet, and what a motif is, it's a single design element uh, from the 2004 project, 332 motifs were recorded on the 45 panels at Red Springs. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the vast majority of them were abstract varieties. In other words, they didn't resemble any animal, any human being, any insect. They were um, rectilinear, curvilinear, um, things that we would not necessarily recognize as representing anything in nature or in human culture. Only about 2%, seven of them, were, repre uh, were representational. In other words, um, they were um, representing human beings or animals or so on and so forth. As you can see, my numbers do not add up. That's a typo, which I will correct, and I apologize for that. Here's an example of some of the motifs. Again, thanks to the Friends of Red Rock. Um, this is panel 6A, which are possible snake and abstract motifs. Snakes were very, very important in terms of um, iconography for um, Puebloan and um, Southwestern religion, uh, representing rebirth, representing water. On the right-hand side, you can see what is probably a centipede. I used to think that these were ladders, but that doesn't make any sense, at least to me at this point. Um, but other abstracts motifs along with it. Interesting thing about this is some of the motifs um, on some of the panels uh, resemble what can be identified as Virgin Anasazi or Pueblo motifs from elsewhere, such as at Valley of Fire. This is a picture of a motif from panel 12. And the, the general consensus is that this is probably represents a blanket or a blanket motif. Now, this is not a common motif, but it is found elsewhere. There's a great one, blanket motif found in Valley of Fire um, um, at Mouse's Tank. As a matter of fact, in the parking, in the parking picnic area across the street from the mouth of Mouse's Tank, uh, back uh, against the sandstone, there are a number of petroglyphs. And a petroglyph, almost a dead ringer for this, is found at this site, 26 CK203, which was recorded, not surprisingly, by our friend Richard Shuttler in his uh, Shuttler and Shuttler um, publication. 
others bear resemblance to found to motifs found elsewhere in Valley of Fire or Brownstone Canyon. Um, and I'll show you some of those. Here on the left-hand side, you can see a Brownstone Canyon lookalike. If you go into Brownstone Canyon, I know some of you are familiar with Brownstone Canyon. As you go into Brownstone Canyon, um, and you're looking straight down Brownstone, as you're walking down Brownstone, on the left-hand side, there is a, um, there is a uh, vertical set of petroglyphs along carved into a sandstone on one side of the, uh, the canyon there. And there are a number of these kind of motifs um, that look like um, the ones at, Browns, at, at Red Springs. These have been interpreted in several different ways. Um, I like to think of them as kind of being um, corn. I think that they are corn motifs, but I'm not swearing to it. There are probably people that have better ideas about these than me. On the right-hand side, you can see panel two of panel 23. Now for the life of me, this looks like um, some of the old uh, casinos in, in, in Las Vegas. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the one that was demolished back in the 90s, um, but you know, it's like the Las Vegas skyline is almost people were predicting the future. But there's, a, there's one similar to this in Valley of Fire. They're right at the mouth of the um, Petroglyph Canyon or Mouse's Tank Canyon um, walkway. Um, as you walk down toward Mouse's um, Tank, on the right-hand side um, of the mouth of the canyon, there were petroglyphs that looked exactly like this. There are additional preliminary counts from several projects um, along with the projectile point totals suggest certain things. Food preparation and tool maintenance were important activities at Red Springs. So people would live at Red Springs and they would not only acquire resources from Red Springs, but they would also maintain their tools at Red Springs as well. You can see the chart on the right-hand side, um, the additional tools from Red Spring that I've managed to locate so far. Um, there were three monos, and this, these are in the collections at uh, the Natural History Museum. I suspect that there's probably more material from Red Springs at the Nevada State Museum in Carson City, which I'm gonna be trying to get my hands on um, in the near future. We have groundstone. We're talking matates are, uh, are of various kinds, uh, 29 of them. Um, choppers, which were used for chopping up food, um, either plant or animal. Hammerstones, utilized flakes. What a utilized flake is, it's a, a flake struck off of a, a core, a rock, either of chert or obsidian or chalcedony, and it's used as a, a cutting tool. Scrapers, which are stone tools used to scrape hides. Unifaces are literally flakes that have a cutting edge on one side. Bifaces, these are tools that are, could almost be blanks for points, but they use more like, um, almost like knives, although they were a little bit ruder and cruder. There are four drills, which were used to punch holes in hides, um, four knives or knife fragments, and 233 flakes. What that is, is like I said, it's the material taken off of a core um, in starting the process of tool manufacturing. The more flakes you have, the more um, activity you have manufacturing tools. Okay. So it suggests that floral resources, uh, plants were important at Red Springs. And the projectile points suggest that hunting went on as well. As we know, there are a number of um, animals that can be hunted in the, uh, in the Spring Mountain area. Um, bighorn sheep and deer, as well as some of the smaller animals as well. And so we ask ourselves a couple of things here. Why was Red Springs such a favorite and heavily used location? Well, here's the most important aspect, water. In the desert, water is literally life. You can live without food, if you can call it living, for about 30 days. In the desert, you, can't, you can live without water for about four or five, maybe six days before you succumb. 
And so water was readily available at Red Springs. There was a spring right at the site in Red Springs. And there are two others um, at nearby locations, uh, Calico Springs, less than a quarter mile to the north, and Ash Creek Spring, approximately uh, a mile or so to the north northwest of Red Springs. And so um, all of these are really important aspects of site location. You know, in the desert, as we all know, you find the water, you find the people. There are also significant floral and faunal resources available both at and near Red Springs. Like I said, uh, bighorn sheep, deer, variety of other animals that could easily have been exploited. And the most important thing is that the location was within fairly easy walking distance, uh, distance to habitation sites in the Las Vegas Valley, meaning both archaic period hunters and gatherers and Virgin Anasazi farmers and gatherers could easily exploit the area. Um, as we know, uh, there were significant numbers of springs and seeps in the Las Vegas Valley um, that were, could be used and that were used uh, by both prehistoric and um, historic inhabitants of the Las Vegas Valley until groundwater pumping destroyed them all in the mid 1950s. And so we have resources, both flora and fauna, we have water and we have easy access because people in those days thought nothing of walking 10, 15 miles to acquire resources, camping overnight and maybe walking back the next day. Now, there are also a lot of other sites in the Calico Basin. Um, like I said, I have this really bad habit of kind of biting off large projects that I don't realize I'm biting off. So uh, there are two sites that I was, I've had, I've been able to do some preliminary artifact analysis done, okay? And I'll show you the map where they are in a minute. One, uh, 26 CK457-4502, was originally recorded by Karma K. Miller, um, probably in 1965 when he was working in the area. And later, minimal data was put on a site sheet by Michael Mullen in 1968. Now, nothing in Miller's field notes suggests that he actually worked at the site, um, put any, did any excavations or anything like that, but there are a number of artifacts from this site in the, the Museum of Natural History collections, probably surface collected by Miller, or maybe even Mullen, we're not really sure, um, that are available for analysis. I re-recorded this site um, in 1990, um, when I owned my own uh, cultural resource management company. Um, and I recorded as 26 CK4502. Now, not support, this gives this the site two site numbers. Why? Well, because I probably didn't do an adequate enough background information research um, on the area, and so I miss either missed the uh, site sheet or the site sheets weren't available in the ship, you know, in the um, records at the time. But I think it's more likely user error. Mine. The site is described with having two roasting pits and a collapsed shelter in the terrace overlooking um, a wash. Now here's a map. You can see the, um, the location of archeological sites that have been officially recorded in the Calico Basin area. Um, you can see where Red Springs is, 224, 458. If you go north and you go straight up um, the paved road, you can see 457 slash 50, 4502. Right, that's the one I'm talking about right now. And there were several others that I recorded in 1990, 4500, 4501, 40, uh, 4503. Um, but there are also a number of other sites that have been recorded. And I understand that uh, uh, the cultural resources team at Red Rock has looked at these or done some work on them. Um, to the north, you have a couple of rock shelters and a roasting pit at least. Um, to the south, you have several sites, um, 26 CK 2620 and then 26 CK 449, 450, 451. The maps in the SHPO records um, kind of have these three sites, 449 through 451 overlapping. 
and doesn't really make a huge distinction. So I've kind of all combined them into that one area. That's probably flat iron, which I have taken a look at um, uh, through the good graces of Ann Newbert, um, the, the Red Rock archeologist. Now, what do we know about 457-4502? It's also called the H&H &H site um, by Miller, and I'm not really sure why. You can see there are uh, a minimum number of projectile points there, uh, 21 total in terms of blanks or fragments as well. Basically, they have mostly later points. The Rose Springs sites, which date to the uh, Virgin Anasazi period, Desert Side Nutch and Cottonwood Triangular, which date to the Paiute of the Pataian period. Then we have a couple of elongated or leaf shaped, which really are kind of generalized points, what are called blanks, which we know were going to be made into points, but for some reason in the middle of the process, uh, the manufacturers then um, stopped or lost them or broke them. So you can see for the most part, we have a late period occupation and use of this site more during the Tepetayan and the Paiute period than any other time. This is the other additional material, flakes, knives, bifaces, et cetera. You can see that there's quite a bit of material here okay? um, for uh, you know, a small um, site. There's a lot of flakes, um, secondary, tertiary, re thinning and resharpening suggests that there's a lot of tool manufacturing and maintenance going on. And as you can see, weirdly enough, unlike um, Red Springs, the majority of the material, um, oh, about 40% or 45% is obsidian. And why that should be, I don't know. Um, what I would have to do is do some obsidian source analysis on these, which hopefully I can do in the future. Again, you can see uh, knives and points. You know, we have knife fragments and we have biface fragments. And so again, we still have the majority of material um, um, that's obsidian, despite the fact that chalcedony forms a little bit more of the biface and knife fragment portion. And then we have some miscellaneous artifacts here. We have cobblestones, we have worked lithics, we have a scraper and a piece of purple glass, which dates historic use to the site before 1917. And at the bottom, we have the totals, the site totals. These um, 151 objects of chert, 17 of chalcedony, obsidian, 63. Chert is more heavily represented in the totals because of the numbers of flakes of chert. Okay. From this preliminary look, H&H &H saw some use during Pueblo 1, 8,800 to 1,000, and then some use from the Paiute Patayan period and beyond. Now, please keep in mind that this is horribly preliminary without any other detailed analyses. And then when, once I get my hands on all the material, um, it looks like the point, the numbers may change. Okay, it looks like a, a combination of hunting and plant processing was going on uh, based on the roasting pit presence. Now, if you look at the artifact types by count, the majority were chert, but again, I think that the chert figure is skewed because of all the flakes with obsidian second. Flakes for tool maintenance or manufacture also dominate, secondary, tertiary, shatter, etc., with knives and points or biface second in the total. So what we have, let me go back to that for a second. What we have is another site um, used by Puebloan and later peoples, um, probably for a sp specific use, probably agave roasting. And then there's another site, which has got me totally puzzled as to where exactly it is. There is a site in um, Karma K. Miller's notes and in the artifact collections called quote unquote site near Pink Mountain. According to the Shippo's office, Pink Mountain is most, is most likely Craft Mountain, which is a geological formation that juts out into the Calico Basin in the Northern periphery of the basin. 
There's a BLM hiking trail along, along the mountain. They call it the Craft Mountain Loop. And a photograph on the website shows a site, a, a roasting pit along the trail at the edge of the La Madre Mountain Wilderness Area. This site hasn't been officially recorded in the Shippo archives and given a site number. And supposedly there's a petroglyph panel somewhere along the trail. So I'm probably gonna have to find that and record it too. But again, gets me out, keeps me busy, keeps me out of my wife's hair. So you can see from minimal numbers of artifacts on this site near Pink Mountain in terms of projectiles, um, we have Elkos, Elko type points are the big kind of dart points used for atlatls or for spears. Um, so they could have been used any time between 2000 and 1080, 2000 BC and 1080 AD. A couple of rose springs and some unknowns. Okay, so there's very little to go on. But we have other artifacts as well. Okay, we have knives. We have a couple of drills, a couple of scrapers. Um, we have flakes. And you notice that the number of flakes are heavily um, skewed to secondary, tertiary, and resharpening flakes. Why? Because there's probably tool manufacturing and maintenance going on there. And chert dominates, with obsidian being second in the totals. And there were three ceramics found there. A brownware shirt from the Paiute, a North Creek gray shirt, um, and an unidentified one. So based on the artifact totals and types, again, this is just wild speculations, ladies and gentlemen. It appears the site, if it's truly a roasting pit site, was used for resource extraction and tool maintenance. The two sherds indicate use or at least a visit during the two different time periods, as well as the point types do. So what does future work bring us. Basically, future work is going to involve completing the artifact analysis from collection at the Natural History Museum. In addition, there are multiple other sites, 14, south and north of Red Springs, that include or need further investigation. That could be included in a larger Red Springs Calico Basin complex, including individual roasting pits, roasting pits associated with petroglyphs, shelters with petroglyphs, shelters with roasting pits, open site scatters, and at least one rock ring. Now, this is gonna take several years, I'm sure. Um, and probably has been stretched out thanks to the world coming to a screeching halt, but I hope to get back to it again sometime in the spring. And I plan to report more fully in both on Red Springs and the associated sites in Calico Basin in the near future. And I'd like to, uh, extend my thanks to a few people. Um, the Las Vegas Natural History Museum, especially Laura Benedict, who is the collection annex manager. Samantha Rubinson, Shippo Southern Office. Rayette Martin from the Shippo Southern Office. Justin DeMeo when he was with the Las Vegas District BLM. And Chuck Williams, Red Rock Canyon Cultural Resources Team. And Annette, who I haven't included here, and I apologize, Annette. I know you're out there listening and scribbling down furiously. Um, who took me out to the uh, Flatiron site and to Red, uh, Red Springs on a field trip from the 2019 uh, Nevada Archaeological Association meetings. So, and these are the references um, that I've used um, for this as well. So that ends that, are there any questions that I can answer or effectively make up stuff about? <laughs> I might be happy to answer them. Okay, Kevin, I'm gonna be viewing the Q&A section and the chat section for you to see if there's any questions coming in. Let me go back to some, some um, cool pictures while we talk. I like those, okay, we'll go with those. So anybody have any questions or did I dazzle them so much they don't even know what to ask? <laughs> well, I did see in the participants, some of the people that uh, attended this evening are actually volunteer site stewards who monitor 
some of the sites that you mentioned nice. this evening. So that's great. They're going to be able to see that um, see that uh, information and and then head out there with a different perspective, maybe. Um, one of our folks asked, do you uh, still utilize volunteers? Um, right now, I'm not capable of utilizing volunteers, but I would certainly love it, absolutely. Um, what I'm gonna do once things settle down a little bit um, and we can actually go out and not have to social distance and walk you know, eight feet or 10 feet away from one another is ask for people and for help from you know, site stewards or you know, the cultural resources team. Um, to help me out. I'd love to have their assistance because this is a big project, one that is way too big for me to handle, I realized. All right, um, I have another question and this is a general question. What is CHERT? CHERT is what we call a crypto crystalline silicate. It's, um, it's a compressed um, uh, silicate deposit and it, it's translucent. So in other words, you can sometimes see through the edges of it when you chip it. And it's a naturally occurring, um, naturally occurring um, lithic resource that's found in, among uh, sandstone deposits. And it's a very, very effective tool stone. Okay, and um, let's see. We've got wondering if site stewards will be asked to help with further excavations. Well, I am not set up to do excavation. Okay, I don't have the equipment or I don't have the lab space. But I may, you know, the further I get into uh, fooling the people at the Natural History Museum into thinking I know what I'm doing. Um, so if that happens, I will certainly be looking for help. Uh, but right now I have no specific plans to do any uh, excavations out there. Okay, and another question, um, how rough are the sites? I'm assuming like how hard are they or how difficult are they to get to? Most most of them don't appear to be very difficult to get to at all. Um, obviously, Red Springs is very easy. Uh, Flat Iron is not bad because it's just over the hill from Red Springs. Um, some of the other sites are just up some of the washes and draws. I think the ones that are probably most difficult to get to are the ones in the northern part of the Calico Basin uh, that are up on the hills or the one that's right by Craft Mountain. But otherwise, they don't seem to be terribly inaccessible at all. Okay, um, switching gears a little bit. Um, it says, Kevin, you've worked at so many sites where water is crucial. Red Rock doesn't have regular water. What role do you think knowledge of seasonal sources played in this? Oh, knowledge, seasonal knowledge is vital. Um, if you're a hunter and gatherer or a part-time farmer, farmer like the Virgin Anasazi were, you have to know the environment and the seasons very, very well. For instance, Calico Tanks in Red Rock is a seasonal water source that holds thousands and thousands of gallons. And so a lot, of, I think a lot of the occupation in Red Rock was based on this uh, seasonal availability of water in these uh, tanks are called, they're called Tinajas in Spanish, T-I-N-A-J-A, -A, which simply means tank or depression. And so absolutely. Um, and I found the same issue um, in Valley of Fire. Valley of Fire is one of the few places I've ever seen that has very limited or almost no permanent water sources in the form of springs. So everything there was dependent basically on these seasonal sources of water. So absolutely, totally vital to the survival of people in this region. Okay. Um... Another question, how far is Obsidian Butte on the test site from Las Vegas? Do you by chance know that? I don't know the exact distance off the top of my head, but it's somewhere centered in the middle of the bombing range. Um, so obviously it's not accessible to us now, but uh, there is evidence that a lot of uh, Obsidian from Obsidian Butte was transported from there into Southern Nevada and into Eastern California and actually even Southwestern uh, Utah. So it was a very, very valuable tool source. Okay, um, how long do you plan to continue your research? Until they tell me to go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, until my wife tells me I'm too old for this foolishness and I need to retire for good. Um, oh, years. Um, you know, I'm only 
so for, for 67. Um, so I've got a number of years ahead of me that I can, I can't walk, at least I can use my brain um, in write and research. So probably at least another 10 years, I would say, if not more. I mean, my inspiration from Harold Larson, who's, you know, who had a dinosaur as a pet. And um, I know you're out there listening, Harold. Um, and so he's still doing work. So I think I can do it as long as Harold. Awesome. Um, another question about the water. Is the water supply from the springs likely to have been consistent, you know, even though it's seasonal, over the last several thousand years? Or could the marsh area have been a pond at one time? Well, I think that the water was probably consistent. Um, the good thing about springs and seeps in the um, Spring Mountain Red Rock area is that they come from water that seeps down through the sandstone based on uh, snowfall. Uh, for the most part, uh, that falls on the top of Mount Charleston and the Spring Mountains. So I think even during the worst periods of drought or the worst periods of aridity in the area, those uh, resources are still available. So it would have been a veritable oasis and lifeline. So I would think they would have been relatively consistent for thousands of years. Okay, and have um, this, Samantha and I may have an answer to this one. Um, have you seen much human impact, at, like damage, vandalism at the sites? Yes, I was, I worked for the Bureau of Land Management in, between 1980 and 1983. Um, when I went out to Red Springs out there, um, you know, it was undeveloped, but you know, there was damage out there to start with. And I am, I know, just from my last few trips out there, that from 1980 to now, there has been a you know, serious human impact um, in the Red Springs. Um, we are fortunate there hasn't been more. Um, and fortunately, the BLM is much more actively managing the Red Springs uh, resources. But yeah, wherever you have people, wherever you have, unfortunately, people stomping around, there's gonna be damage. Yeah, and I can say with the stewardship program, we do have, like I said, people monitoring that and it, um, Red Springs, like the boardwalk area and stuff like that is hit on a regular basis with new graffiti and, and other types of impacts. Um, a, a different type of question, uh, why is there an S at the end of the location name? She has only identified a single spring. So we call it Red Springs. Right. There's a reason it has an S. Right. So we did have some nice comments. Um, we really appreciate your presentation. It inspires us to keep up the work we do as site stewards. So thank you for inspiring our volunteers. And um, we even have a former student of yours who took your cultural anthropology class who said, thank you so much for all you do as Dr. Rafferty. Well, well, I am not seeing. I haven't ruined that person. That's good. I want to thank all the stewards and all the avocationalists who have worked out here and have shared their knowledge and their time and their locations with me. I really, really appreciate it. Unlike some of my colleagues elsewhere, not in Southern Nevada, um, the, the work of the avocationalists is very, very welcomed and well-respected. All right. And I'm not seeing any further questions. And actually that student I was talking about is a site steward as well. So good job, Kevin. <laughs> I've corrupted a few. I've actually got some, some of my students working for several of the cultural resource management firms in the area. So I have corrupted my share. It's good. Excellent. All right, everybody, thank you again. Um, wait, I might have one. Nope, just a great trip down memory lane. Thank you.
Excellent. Well, All right. Well, thanks again. You're welcome. All right. Bye, Kevin. Bye, guys. Appreciate your, your presence.